Welcome, everyone, to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. I am your host, Jason Miles, and as you can see, my shirt's unbuttoned to my navel because it's hot as shit in Mexico for some odd reason in the middle of the goddamn winter. Another man whose shirt definitely stays unbuttoned to his navel, but did not in our talk with Oxford University. He came in a suit. For those of you that voted for Pascal in a suit, Pascal was in a suit and he looked and sounded marvelous thing to behold. So let me introduce my homie, my dog, the man of the Mau Mau Hour, Pascal Robert. Oh, oh man, I didn't even hear the applause. Peace and there you go. There you go. There you go. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles. And I want to say, for those who do not know, yesterday, Jason and I had the privilege and honor to give a presentation via Zoom to a panel of uh, students and academics at Oxford University in, in England, in the UK, the United Kingdom. And I got to tell you, I was feeling my whole kind of like James Baldwin, Malcolm X kind of vibe. If you do not know, both of those two men lectured at Oxford, even though it was a Zoom call and people were all in their rooms and whatnot, it still felt pretty good. And I think our presentation went very well. And they, uh, we wow, we they were impressed and we wowed the crowd. This it is was, the Haitian dad shirt. That's true. Um, that's the Haitian. Is it? Is it also unbuttoned to your navel? No, it's like. I got the second button button. I, I, I'm officially the guy that's got the sloppy body that's walking around topless now because I feel that coming. My island hair neck. I'm not even wearing socks. Caution to the wind. Another so unfortunately, sadly, we got the word last minute that Marcus will not be uh with us hurts my soul but uh we will we will soldier on but in his place i was able to make a phone call to the death star and we were able to get their finest in middle management you know him as the man that makes your phone make strange sounds we just know him as deep state kuba please welcome deep state Cuba. We're waiting for Deep State Cuba. There he is. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry, sorry there was an an Ewok got into the Wi-Fi, so uh, we had a bit of a hiccup, and he had uh, to get dealt with. But the Wi-Fi is fine, right? <laughs> the Ewok was turned into Ewok burgers, but the Wi-Fi is fine. Wi-Fi yeah, stuff. I mean, he was he was disposed of according to protocol. There Always, go. always. Mm-hmm. Gotta love that protocol. Keep this shit above board here. Mm-hmm. So, coming live from further south in America than me is the co-author of a book that definitely has captured my attention, and I do have to say. One of the things I do appreciate um, in doing this show has been our relationship with um, Doug Lane and the writers at Zero Books. And, you know, even though he's not there anymore, uh, a lot of the the authors that we've had on here, they've been some kind of fascinating reads. And this was another one uh, in line with a read that kind of is is definitely in line with what i've been working on as far as uh even my writing and, and research so um i don't know how much of the book you got to, to read pascal did you get to read a decent decent amount of it i did i got i got in pretty pretty decent kuba did you uh you finished it the um well you know i, I had already read it when um it, when it went came through out. the uh, nsa for uh <laughs> 
<laughs> highlighting all possible sources, figuring it out, you know, who who was he talking to? And um <laughs> adding them to the to the, you know, um I'm not saying it's a drone strike list. I'm just saying it's a drone ready to go list. <laughs> Please welcome <laughs> author and scholar, political commentator, and and we always advertise the books, and there's always links in the description wherever you're watching the show and listening to the show to the book. But really, I thought this was a kind of a fascinating book, especially uh, when we talk about where we are today. There's a few books that have really um, kind of captured my attention fully. This one, and then uh, the homie Andres Malm, uh, and, and his books, uh, especially the, the the latest one. So, please welcome Alex Hockley. Hello. Hello. Okay. I'm gonna wait for the applause to die down. Can I go now? <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for having me. No, delighted to be here, and it's delighted. Uh, really nice to. Have such enthusiastic readers uh, whether they work for the nsa or not um <laughs> i guess the the bots at the nsa must be very close readers of course being machines but it's always nice to have human readers as well so thank you excellent yeah, oh, we, death we, to the end of history long live the future says boris negara rosa that well, is all right my ex-wife's maiden name don't get emotional wait no i just be mad if kruger rand no, they're, they're they must be Swedish Krona. So okay, you want to start? The, the, you want to start it off Cooper, with the first question? So um, I guess that one um, one place to start, like uh, you refer to a lot of the popular culture of the '90s and the early 2000s, and that's a very familiar moment to me. And I think that one. Um, one fact that maybe some of our younger listeners may not understand is just how hegemonic the concept of the end of history was in that period uh, how many millions of copies fukuyama sold and um, when i was an undergraduate for instance no course on international affairs uh, could afford to ignore fukuyama so maybe why is it still relevant to talk about um, his work and why, um, what makes this moment so different as to, as to, you know, really shift it from everybody needs to talk about Fukuyama to everybody needs to understand why he was wrong? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And I mean, I also remember, you know, being an undergraduate and uh, like studying international relations and being like, oh, this is the end of history thing. And it seemed kind of complicated. And I think a lot of people, at least I remember uh, kind of looking back, people who are on my course, didn't really take it seriously, especially because it was kind of like, yeah, that's all this. <laughs> like literally, like the end of history means that all the conflictual crazy stuff that happened in history, the Cold War and everything before, that's all in the past. So let's get up to speed with this new technocratic world of globalization and everybody wanted to talk about globalization theory no one really wanted to talk about the end of history which really means they didn't want to grapple with history in a capital h sense the ability of human beings to make history right not just the past um and it's also interesting that you made reference to kind of younger listeners it's something we tried to do in the introduction to the book um is precisely try to capture that sense of what the end of history was like kind of culturally in terms of affect and so on uh, because if you grew up kind of after the or came of age you know, or at least g came, gained some political consciousness maybe as a teen as of the later than the 2008 global financial crisis you're already a, like uh, take as a given this kind of new turbulent world right an increasingly turbulent world and if you did if you grew up like i did kind of you know kind of coming of age in the 2000s becoming adult in the 2000s like you were just you were all you knew was this wasteland of politics and this kind of attempts at doing radical alternative politics, which really went nowhere, right? Um, and so we tried to capture that a little bit. As to why Fukuyama is is relevant, I guess, but maybe just answer that, I guess. 
is that I think a lot of people misunderstood what he was trying to say. So the end of history as an idea isn't just, hey, there's no more events anymore. Like everything's just the same and peaceful. That wasn't, you know, that wasn't his his argument. You know, there might still be events, there might still be terrorist attacks as they're proved to be, right? But these forms of kind of nihilism effectively, or, you know, even if you believe in what the Islamists say about their own ideology, it doesn't really propose to transform the world or to make the world a better place. You know, it doesn't really have that capacity. We, what the end of history really means is the end of ideology and the end of conflicting visions over how to organize human society. Right. So it means that, like, even if there are Islamist attacks or kind of ethnic rebellions or whatever there might be, there's nothing that seriously challenges liberal capitalism. And that really seemed to be the case for a long time. And, and it kind of still does. The only way that liberal capitalism is really being challenged is by its own internal contradictions, it seems. We can come on to that, I guess. Well, um, the even the strong reactions of groups like um, ISIS are, they don't offer a future. Their best alternative is let's go back to the Islamic golden age. Let's return yeah. to the caliphate. So you have these, uh, and Fukuyama in his, uh, in his work, he describes these as kind of atavisms, right? They're not fighting for the future. They want to return to um, what they perceive to be a superior past. And it's really that lack of a future to fight over that um, is part of the end of history. Can, can, I ask, can, I ask the, can I ask the panel a question? Would you say that's an, a phenomenon that actually starts to take place in the 80s, kind of uh, a need for nostalgia? I think that the nostalgia is, nostalgia is woven into every human culture and every human moment always has something about the past that they romanticize, that they, um, that they, uh, that appeals to them. And even in periods where there is a lot of optimism about the future and it feels like things are, um, happening, you do have, um, it's spoken of in a kind of wistful way, a little like, um, 20th century, early 20th century ideas about Native Americans or the Wild West, right? Yeah. That was really beautiful, but it's disappearing uh, to give way for our modern civilization, which is kind of sad and bittersweet, but, you know, uh, progress. And I think that the um, when you foreclose the fight over the future, then, uh, and it really seemed in the 1990s, especially like pre-Bush, when Clinton was in power, but the um, but the Soviet Union was gone, that they had this was the victory of this neoliberal capitalism. There's going to be a Starbucks on every block. The American financial system is going to own everything, and it'll somehow be okay because at least it's not totalitarian, and also everybody make money because now it's um it's a real free-for-all there's opportunity in spades because of the internet and the you just had to get with the program it was the only one in town and you uh if you wanted to have any f future for yourself personally you had to adjust to the fact that this was the world and one of the end of history concepts was also that you don't backslide what we have now, all of the achievements, whether it's globalization or pandemic control or um, rational governance, they were somehow locked in, that we had passed a point of no return. And although things like climate change might be a challenge, the systems fundamentally worked. So we just had to let them. Well, one of the, to answer your question, Jason, from my perspective, as someone who was basically coming into young adulthood in the 80s, literally the year I went into high school, Reagan was coming into the second year of his presidency. So the most consistent thing I can tell you about the 80s from my experience was the, the comprehensive feeling that was being conveyed that everything in the 60s was wrong and bad. That was a sense that was a very big part. It wasn't so much of a kind of uh, of a kind of uh, 
call back to a golden age of America per se, right? Because most people who were adults at that time were children in the 50s. You know, the baby boomers were kind of kids in the 50s. They were the kids of the 60s. When I, and when I look at the American governing power structure at that time, you know, Reagan was like a septuagenarian. You had Tip O'Neill, another old guy. You know, those guys were a generation that were old enough to fight in World War II. They were old enough to actually remember the 50s. But the messaging that I found that was being conveyed in the 80s was not so much kind of a wanting to go back to the good old days of the 50s, since part of the messaging was also gutting the New Deal Civil Rights Coalition. So that wasn't the messaging. The messaging, though, that was very much a strong part of what you were getting, and this is what was even being supported with the think tanks like the, you know, the Manhattan Institute, the, the, this, this, this was the ideological conceptualization that was being financed that the 60s was wrong. It was a mistake. There's a book, I think, I, I forget the name of the book, that George uh, Bush, the father, said that he read that, and I'm almost convinced that it came out of the Manhattan Institute, that I think it was called uh, Poverty and Wealth or something like that. I'll find the name of the book. But the book, basically, the whole premise of the book is about how the 1960s was wrong. It was a big mistake. It led to all these problems in the U.S. And that was a very big part of the energy that I found that you saw in the 80s. And quite frankly, back to the theme that we have on this show, the 50-plus year counter-revolution, in my analysis of America's post-civil rights, post-60s political posture, that's a consistent theme, quite frankly, that we still see to, to, this, to, to, to today. Until it, it, it's, it's something that's consistent even up and throughout today's American politics, that somehow we went awry in the 60s and we have to do a corrective. You know, we had the, the rise of the tri of trilateralism under Jimmy Carter, which was literally birthed under the the belief that you know the left went the liberals and the left went too far with the sixties, and the, the Democrats have to move back to the center. So I find that that type of discourse was not only a heavily a heavy part of what was going on in the eighties, but is a consistent thread that exists throughout American politics from the 60s up until today. I'd like to hear what Alex, Alex thinks about that, if he agrees or disagrees. No, that's really interesting, because I think uh, we've just done this series on uh, on BungaCast about generations, right? Exploring kind of the sequence of generations and how you've got this new generational conflict. And something we discussed in the book as well about how this new kind of generational war that's happening now, like the kind of OK Boomer kind of stuff, is in some ways a, a, a channeling of all these political energies to something which is pretty self-defeating, channeling it away from uh, class politics, away from socialist politics towards this kind of futile generational struggle. What's interesting about that, and the reason I mention it, is that it still seems 50 years on or more that we're still that a lot of politics, especially in the US, but to a certain extent in Britain and in other places, is still being fought over the 60s in different ways. So I agree with Pascal's point about the kind of counter-revolution or, you know, the opposition and undoing of the New Deal that you've had in, in the United States, especially since the 1980s, the kind of neoliberal counter-revolution or however you want to uh, frame that. But there's also another element to it, which is that the 60s also in some ways unleashed certain desires or was uh, a moment for kind of the birth of the counterculture, which was in, way, in a way something that capitalism then tried to recuperate and successfully did it. Right. So these demands for authenticity, for liberation, for uh, exploration of the self, all these kinds of things are now things that you can do in the market. Right. So it's not something that was in the Facebook. minds of the 60s rebels, which was something done against the market or against capitalism. What we have now is still we're still living in the world created by the boomers and by kind of certain aspects of the counterculture, which have been kind of redigested and regurgitated by capital and sold back to us. Um, so, you know, you can explore your sexuality, your gender identity, for example, but it's entirely in kind of consumerist fashion. And that's just one example, right? And so in some ways, we're still living in the world where we're fighting over the 60s. So you have the kind of anti-60s people who were kind of neoliberals, the anti-60s people who are 
you know, kind of conservatives or neoconservatives or maybe kind of right populists today. Um, but in some sense, they're also ch children of the 60s. You know, Trump, for, to take just one example, you know, just his um, kind of grotesque kind of thing, his showmanship, all that kind of stuff. Like he's not the kind of buttoned up old style conservative. And so in that sense, he's a child of the conservative, a, chi a child of the kind of the counterculture and the 60s as much as he is an opponent of it. So I think it's weird. We're still kind of stuck competing over the 60s and it'd be nice to be able to move on and move past that. Well, I think one reason why the 60s has such a uh, powerful hold on the minds of, uh, um, you know, not just the boomer generation and why uh, containing and um, purging the 60s is a conservative pre uh, preoccupation um, is that the idea that you could have such a high level of um, social uh, breakdown of order not i'm not i was going to say social breakdown but it's not that it has to do with um a, a weakening of systems of order and systems of control over people so that individuals uh, can do whatever they want and that is scandalous for conservatives and it in their imagination leads to a larger scale political economic social uh, problems you know but people if you talk to a right winger they act as though crime was invented in the 1960s right like before that people were, were you know just too god darn church church going and innocent to actually do bad things and then the 60s kind of opened the door for uh, the egoistic pursuit of self and everything went to hell and I think that in the um, there's a conservative reaction to the 60s to try to undo all of the culture countercultural changes uh, to people's ideas and lifestyles, but also the neoliberal turn in some ways is a reaction to the disorder of the 60s through um, in governance systems. You know, surveillance, um, we're going to nudge you online, we're going to use behavioral psychology to um, allow people the maximum amount of freedom while actually making sure that they don't misuse it, and steer them in socially cohesive directions. And the anti-politics of the 90s and 2000s is in some ways that type of softer, gentler imposition of order. You know, we don't care about your sexuality anymore. And, we're not going to use moral blackmail on you, but we're just going to kind of reduce the likelihood that anybody is organizing or um, or working on uh, projects, groups, movements that pose a threat to this to this order that's been reestablished uh, through the market and through corporate hierarchies more so than the state. Well, I mean, I think at a fundamental level, right, there's a certain element here that I think cannot be neglected, that the, the 60s were bad discourse, I, I, I refuse to separate it from the racial component to it as well. The part of the part of the, the conservative reactionary antagonism towards the 60s stems from a certain kind of like, before the 60s, we had those darkies under control. And see what happened? We let them, we let, we gave them some rights and everything went wrong. And yeah, I'm, law I'm, and order. Where's the law and order? I mean, that, a lot that, of people are fighting for that the becomes rights. racialized. You know, let's let's keep in mind. You also have a, a big uh, Mexican American movement. You have the American Indian movement in in the later '60s as well. So there, there's a huge pushback for all all uh, dark people in the '60s. Yeah. So I mean, the, the 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 larger point I'm trying to convey, right, is that right. Though I, I'm not going to be reductionist or race reductionist, if you will, enough to believe that. The whole fifty-year counter-revolution is about crack crushing down on black people. It's, I, I, I don't believe that at all. But what I do realize is because of the racialization of America it, historically, it's convenient to use issues of racial flashpoints as a kind of pretext to engage in the social recasting and in engineering that goes from neo from you know neoliberalism to mass incarceration, to all of those other forms of social control that become necessary in the post-New Deal civil rights era and the 50-year 50 50 year plus counter-revolution, 
it becomes very convenient, particularly when you have large numbers of black people basically coming out of the share the sharecropper domestic labor economic paradigm and walking into a post civil rights America that is now facing the de- industrialization uh, and, and uh, urban decay that it becomes very, very convenient to make uh, race or and black folk in general, the bet noir, if you will, excuse the pun, of uh, what's what's the problem with America. And what we do find, as my recent piece, uh, Black People, the Crash Test Dummies for Democrats, uh, illustrates in Black Agenda Report, go check that out, is that the use of racial dog whistles appeals to working class whites, to uh, law and order, social chaos, moral decay, uh, state dependency, tough on crime, uh, urban underclass uh, ideology. All of these dog whistles were bipartisanly used by both Republicans and Democrats over this period of time from the rise of Nixon up until really, I would say, up until today. I would even argue that Obama uses racial dog whistles with the way he telegraphs contempt for you know the black underclass and the black poor, you know cousin cousin Pookie eating you know Popeye's fried chicken chicken on Sunday, giving speeches about black men on Father's Day and their need to become responsible. All of that discourse, all of that racialized discourse, becomes an actual weapon used by both political parties in America, pretty much consistently. I would say even up to Trump, maybe the only one who doesn't do it racially is maybe George Bush, the son, George W. Bush, which doesn't surprise me that he actually saw an increase in uh, black voter support for him in his reelection bid. So that type of racialized narrative as a means to, to basically justify the hammer of the state and capital coming down in the uh, the uh, the neoliberal era of the post civil rights period of the fifty plus counter year revolution was effective, and what I am arguing, but in the context of American politics, I can't really talk about Britain because I know your book really deals with the Anglo American world, but I don't think we can deny that in terms of the United States, that is a very important fulcrum as to how. The, not only the neoliberal turn, but the increase of, 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 of uh, uh, militarization of police, the, in, in, uh, the use of uh, kind of invasive uh, social control mechanisms in surveillance, which also after 9-11, right, who becomes the new N-word on the block is the Muslims, which also gives justification for the development of the Department of Homeland, Homeland Security and a whole nother wave of a type of intrusive uh, investigatory mechanism that permeates American society as well. So otherization, whether it's black people or Muslims or, or Latinos, otherization becomes a very, very important uh, uh, ch- cross point into how the politics of this period is actually uh, seen through. I'd like to know if you guys agree or disagree. Yeah, I mean, I think like the obviously the the question of the '60s, I think, can't be discussed in the U.S. context without the racial question. So I think it's it's obvious that it's central there in a way that it's less central um, in Britain or in France. Or th- though there it'd be different because France it might be about Algeria, right? Um, France's colonial history. So anyway, the, the, obviously the questions are are a little bit different. Um, what I think is interesting is like the point about authorization, right? And I totally agree that that's always been used as a as a plank or as a um, kind of stepping stone towards greater social control, uh, surveillance, militarization of policing, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, I think what's interesting now, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong in terms of my read of what's going on in American politics, but you have kind of a, a effectively uh, professional class liberals now trying to other even kind of white people, right? Like poor white people um, or you know, people who voted for Trump. You know, and you see this stuff like where they're being compared to the Taliban, right? Like um, kind of right populism. And so that's, ISIS. Yeah, <laughs> right. And so that seems to be part of the same process. And so it's not, I mean, I'm not trying to make an argument about like, oh, they, these people too. It's just that this seems to be part of a of, a, of an ongoing tendency towards growing state power and, well, uh, and so on. 
Mm-hmm. What's very oh. fascinating, Alex, that you say, and I want Cuba to jump in as well, is mm-hmm. that I totally agree with you that there is a type of otherization of the white working class that's being done by liberal elites in the faction of the Democratic Party that, I, number one, it's not going to work well for them politically. And number two, it's only feeding more power to the reactionary right. And number three, it's actually justifying their belief that the liberals are out of touch and are the enemy of the masses. And going back to something you said that I found very fascinating, I think Cuba touched on in on it as well, when Cuba kind of said that ISIS really doesn't have a vision of the future, it just has a vision of the past. And relating that to, to, uh, to Jason's questions about did we kind of see the 80s as a period where people were looking to the past? And my response was, I think it was more of a rejection to the 60s. What I do see in Trumpism and this iteration of the reactionary right, particularly with discourse around family values, the need for the traditional male, the need for American values, this iteration of American conservatism is much more obsessed with going back to a glorious American past than the one I saw in the 80s or even in the Bush years. I think that... I see them as being much more reactionary in that context. I think that that's right. In in the United States, the Trump rhetoric, like make America great again, this kind of this kind of language, this kind of idea, uh, stems partly from the fact that when you had Reagan and Bush in charge, the, you didn't have to go back. That America was still alive and kicking. The uh, men, most people, you know, many millions of people lived in that America. And, you know, it's like, oh, thank God I don't live in New York with all the crime or Detroit or San Francisco. Um, but I have my wholesome little house and I'm going to vote for Pat Buchanan. The, because of the neoliberal deindustrialization and the hollowing out economically of the American middle class, now that America is essentially, for most people, dead and unattainable. And it is a political project to try to restore it and something that you could try to use to mobilize people. And uh, to go back to the uh, point that Pascal made about uh, racialization and then uh, the demonization of uh, Muslims, the development of hard coercion, uh, again, as a form of social control in the 80s, 90s, uh, I think that there was this Fukuyama notion that the uh, free market economy would work with incentives and invisible nudges and um, this kind of behavioral technocracy um, in a fairly uh, non-violent way for most people. But then in order to create the market, in order to clear the space for the market, you were going to impose some shock therapy. There were, were going to be some human costs. And depending on which context you're in, whether it's Europe, whether it's the United States, that burden um, fell on different groups. And in the US, the rollback of things like state support, welfare, um, uh, food stamps, and then all of the work requirements related to um, getting any kinds of benefits, you have a very hard coercive system starting to be applied uh, especially to black people. With the 2008 crisis, it turns out that that middle class, comfortable, affluent corporate model of a you know successful capitalism that was going to supposedly lead to general prosperity hasn't panned out even for white people. Like there's a, a much larger group that is experiencing economic dislocation and need to be sacrificed to the market. And therefore, those coercive tactics that start out being applied to uh, black people and minorities in the US begin to be applied to more and more people until it's no longer uh, limited by 
identity categories, but it just becomes a general framework for governing the disordered masses, regardless of, of color. And um, the Democrats have isolated themselves so much from um, the working class population that they lump everybody in into it now, um, except through the sort of woke sacralization of certain um, certain victimhood narratives. Yeah, that's bang on. I totally agree with that and the way you've put that, Kuba. I think what's interesting is that uh, it seems that today, like also take, taking what you just said as a hook, is that, you know, there's more basis now for working class unity in the United States, like materially, than there maybe ever has been because of those, because the position that you know, effectively what the kind of white mates mainstream uh, of the working class, maybe lower middle class that it finds itself in now it is no longer the sort of privileged position that it was during the kind of post New Deal period. Um, but what I find interesting, and, and I want to just uh, go back a little bit to the question of nostalgia, right? So uh, Pascal was talking about the appeal uh, to especially working class and middle class whites in the United States of this idea of going back to that kind of privileged role that they had of kind of security of, of a nice suburban home, et cetera, which is now obviously uh, very practically unattainable um, unless you're of an older generation who still has that. But for many people that's already slipped away. So, okay, there's always going to be an appeal back to something which has been recently lost and which has been lost in, in living memory. But what's interesting is that, you know, right populism and left populism for that matter as well also acts as an agent of, politicization. So it's not just nostalgia of, hey, let's go back to what was in this nice old comfortable period. There's also kind of rupture with the end of history. And this is why we talk about the end of it, the end of the end of history. Um, I say we talk about it. It's like it's the title of the book. So I guess we think it's kind of important. <laughs> but the, the idea there is that this sort of anti-politics presents a rupture. And anti-politics, uh, if I can just explain what, how we understand that, is this rejection of the political establishment. And so that's different to the post politics that operated in the 90s and 2000s. That was the kind of politics of consensus, of technocracy, no ideological contestation. We already know what the answers are. It's Bill Clinton. Demobilization politics. Demobilization, right. Like we're the adults in the room, us political elites, we're gonna de deal with things. Uh, and you people just turn up at the ballot every once in a while, but we basically know what the answers are. We just need to implement them, right? Um, that post-politics then is suddenly challenged by anti-politics. And that anti-politics kind of goes, no, none of you people are legitimate. We reject you all. Now, that rejection isn't done necessarily in the name of socialism. Um, it's maybe done. Huh? It might be true and on at, at its most extreme, like, uh, you know, it, it extent. And, but it's also can be it, in more kind of moderate forms in the form of Brexit in the UK, right? So kind of rejection of the EU, which is a major pillar of technocracy, of holding down politics and saying, hey, no, what we know what the answers are. You people stay, be quiet, go away. Um, Alex, would you and, say, would you say and, and, go politics? On. I'm sorry, Alex, just want to just want to kind of say, would you say that anti-politics is just the politics of no? Kind of. I, I mean, at, at its most basic it's level. And, and so what we try to deal with in the book is to try to show how contradictory it is. Because on the one level, anti-politics is politicizing because it rejects the consensus of elites. But at the same time, it can be self-defeating because it's so deeply skeptical of the possibility even of political representation. It kind of says, no, we, we're all, we don't believe in elections. Okay, maybe you don't believe in elections, fine. But it says, we don't believe in any leaders, any people who, who, who try to stand for an idea. And in that sense, it can be very corrosive. So that's why it's such an ambiguous thing. And so you can have, the right wing form of anti-politics, which we can see in the form of Trump, especially Trump in 2016. But you can also have left wing forms of, of uh, anti-politics, which is, for example, the horizontalism of Occupy saying, hey, we have no leaders, right? Which kind of ends up rejecting any sort of ideological coherence effectively um, in the name of just, hey, we're all out on the streets. We are organized on Facebook and we're here. And you see the denouement of that in things like the Arab Spring. Hey, we're all out here together on the streets. And what does that lead to? Nothing. And then you've got a kind of centrist form of anti-politics as well, which you can think of the various forms of anti-corruption politics. It's something that we kind of catalog in the book where it also just says, hey, you people are all corrupt, right? And, you know, no one's for corruption, obviously. But where does that anti-corruption politics lead if it's not done in the name of an idea of how to organize society and just says no? And that's what's so 
problematic about our current period because you have a lot of no's suddenly in a way you didn't have no's back in the back in the 90s and 2000s. The 90s and 2000s, no one was paying attention. Suddenly everyone's paying attention going, is angry and saying, hey, no, but there's no real kind of idea of what to go here around um, across the political spectrum, which is why politics is so turbulent and messy today. Well, one of the things that uh, that's fi I find fascinating about the anti-politics uh, thesis that you put forth is, and I agree with it largely, is that number one, the left version of the anti-politics has proven over and over again to be totally bankrupt. In other words, no structure, no organization, no hierarchy from Black Occupy Lives to Matter. Black Lives Matter to whatever else. They all either become just wiped away by you know whatever internal governing mechanisms exist or just end up becoming totally useless grifters who line their pockets with money off of people's suffering. So mm. that has just been an endemic demonstration of the kind of vapidity of the left in this moment where the left should have really been more capable of rising to the challenge. But what is fascinating in terms of the anti-politics on the right is that the way in which the carnage from the neoliberal turn, all right, the post-civil rights era change in capitalism, hyper-privatization, hyper-austerity, hyper-authoritization, and all of that stuff, which was a bipartisan consensus, which we all know, but because of the way in which the liberal flank of the ruling class in, insults the intelligence of the average American in the way they dispatch of the period of, you know, you, you know, you give us the first black president who says hope and change, you know, yes, we can. And he's killing us with austerity and financing trillions of dollars going to banks at the same time while, you know, basically giving no recourse to working class people and kids are getting, you know, eviscerated with opioids and black kids getting shot by cops every third day of the week. And this was supposed to be the hope and change. So the transparent bankruptcy of the left flank of capital to govern in this period becomes profoundly transparent. And what has, what happened, what ends up being a, a consequence of that is that with the rise of the reactionary right and you know problems, for example, of the immigra immigration crisis in Europe that is seen to be, again, blamed on the liberals or the, the left flank of capital, it be, the anti-politics is captured by the reactionary right, and it becomes an anti-politics against the whole liberal democratic post-World War II project. And the only thing this anti-politics finds valuable is the identity and culture of the citizens. And it does embody a kind of fascistic uh, ambiance in that regard, in that there are no real politics around Trumpism or yeah. Orbanism or Marine Le Pen or Bor or or uh, 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 Bor or uh, Boris Johnson, except they've gone too far. We've got to bring it back to the way we need to do things for us, which is back to the nation state against global global. Uh, global organizational management, whether it be the EU, whether it be NATO, whether it be the IMF, the World Bank, against uh, you know international banking cartels, whatever the conspiracy theory they may have, to be like, back back to the Volk. Let us let, let the Volk get back in power and take care to take care of our little plot of nation state and forget these others. This globalism thing has let's, been a horror let's get, for us. Let's get Alex's response to this. Yeah, I mean, well, obviously, you know, if you look at someone like Orban, who in reality is completely in hoc to German capital, right? You know, it's like a, it, it's a it's a Volkswagen plant. You know, that's what uh, that's what Hungary is. So, you know, obviously, there's a lot of uh, there's very little kind of material basis to even their reactions against globalization. Okay, there's a little bit here and there, and we can see in the way that to a certain extent, Biden offers continuity with Trump in, in kind of a repeal from globalization, you know, a little bit of a recoil from globalization. But in obviously, in, in, in actual fact, they offer very little politics. Um, where I was kind of trying to put a positive spin on right populism, because um, no one wants to do that, obviously. So uh, that's why I, <laughs> that's why I tried it, um, is because, uh, well, it, I mean, 
So th basically the idea is that, as I'm saying it, it presents a point of opposition. So even, at least in contrast to what was the dominant ideology until around 2016, uh, it, it acts as an agent of politicization. So even Trump's kind of acting like an agent of chaos can be seen at least in some sense positively in contrast to what came before, right? So in terms of politicizing the present, in terms of really understanding our present moment, I think we have to understand that right populism is part of a broad move towards politicization, which is very important, right? Now, that isn't to try to say that the politics of the uh, populist right is in any way good, or indeed even to say that it is that political. And I totally agree with what, what Pascal was saying, is that it probably doesn't really have a real politics. Um, in fact, to me, that we argue in the book is that only the left is able to really uh, be an agent of politicization because politics and the left are um, kind of uh, conjoined at birth, right? Um, because the right, as an, always as an agent of order in some sense, is never going to be an agent of politicization because politicization precisely is in some sense putting claims of justice, of, of, uh, of dissensus, of challenging the way that things are, right? And so the right can only offer a kind of spectral vision of that. Unfortunately, the left hasn't been able to do it either. So the left hasn't um, really um, been able to uh, kind of cash that check of, of politicization. And, and so we talk a lot in the book about the failure of left populism, of this thing that the, this thing that kind of emerged in 2015 with the Bernie campaign in the US, with Corbyn uh, in the UK, and that was already happening with Podemos in Spain, with Syriza in Greece and where that also was unable to really force the rupture necessary to really have genuine politics. So in the case of the US, there was never really a rupture with the Democratic Party establishment, and it's probably the most obvious reason that Bernie fails in, in 2019, 2020. Uh, in the UK, the, um, the whole kind of momentum, literally the organization momentum, and the whole movement around Corbyn never really breaks with the EU and takes seriously the democratic legitimacy of the Brexit vote. And so as a consequence gets folded into effectively the kind of technocratic elite because it doesn't really want to, it doesn't really want to make a move, doesn't make a stand. And as a consequence tries to say, yeah, we're kind of pro Brexit, but also we're not exactly because the right has dominated Brexit. So we don't want anything to do with that. As a consequence, it never really forces that rupture necessary, um, which could have been hugely progressive as a consequence it's left to Johnson and the Tories to see through Brexit, and we can see the consequences of that now. Um, and you can see it in Greece as well. So, you know, this was all kind of played out uh, well before the kind of Anglo-American world had it, which was Greece's confrontation with the Euro, with the Eurozone and with the EU um, in, in 2015, where there as well, there was a huge vote to reject the memorandum uh, um, of the Eurozone, 61% uh, no. The government, supposedly a radical left government, said we're going to honor this, right? <laughs> Which any radical left government should honor a, a democratic referendum, I would say. And then they turned the back on it the next day because they realized that the consequences of that would be hugely disruptive. And so they may decide to stay in the EU. And so the necessary rupture never really happened. And that's why left populism failed. And so in some sense, this anti-politics across the spectrum, albeit in different ways, ends up self-defeating or ends up unable to realize its own promises of politicization. Um, I wanted to read a, a passage from your, your book. Um, it's actually kind of in the beginning of it. Uh, you say, we stand at a pivotal moment amid the chaos, states of emergency and extraordinary state responses. We are undergoing an epochal political shift. The richest and most powerful states in the West are fumbling their way out of neoliberalism. Such regime change had almost been forgotten as a possibility unless it was applied at the end of a gun in distant lands. Or at least we thought that if regime change were to happen, it would be different. The coronavirus outbreak can coincided with the undoing of a surge of left-wing attempts to gain state power, the defeat of Jeremy Corbyn's Labor Party, and the collapse of Bernie Sanders' campaign for president came within four months of each other, either side of the initial lockdowns. These attempts, called, quote-unquote, left populism, aim to move beyond neoliberalism to defend welfare and create a new collective and egalitarian politics. They felt promising. 
They made it feel like maybe politics was back after a long time away. The failure of left, pop, left populism, strangely, happened at the same time as right-wing governments adopted policies that strongly departed from neoliberal orthodoxy. Donald Trump passed a $3 trillion stimulus package while Boris Johnson's government announced 100 billion pounds in extra spending to pay 80% of wages and support the self-employed. Policies the left had been proposing were recuperated by the right, and this was done at, the, at just the moment of the greatest popular demobilization in history, the lockdowns. There is a deep irony to this, since one of the main problems with left populism was that it had tried to do socialism without the masses. Let me that tell you why a, that's important. Let me tell you why that's an important quote. You know why it's an important quote? Not to be, I told you so. But it, it emphasizes something I said in the last episode we did where we were talking about the American decline. Mm -hmm. The right will do some form of at least Keynesianism, maybe not total social democracy, but at least Keynesianism to preserve their political hegemony. And what we saw with COVID, more so with Boris Johnson than Trump, because we know that Trump's $3 trillion was basically a, a giveaway to the 1% more than anything else. Even though he did give, you know, he put cash in people's hands. People got checks. People got checks. That's right. But the point I'm trying to say is that I am a little bit more sanguine about the capacity of the reactionary right. If they get back in power, we might be able to say when they get back in power, being willing to implement policy in between either Keynesianism or even a light social democracy to not only maintain their political hegemony, but to increase support amongst their ranks. I don't think it's outside because they're not as, I think they are less, yes, we have the libertarian phenomenon in the United States, but I truly believe that the Trumpian faction in the US and even Boris Johnson are less ideological and less ideologically wedded to neoliberalism than the actual Democrats and yeah. Labor Party in Europe. Yep. You, you know what stuck out to me when I when I read that? Um, I thought of Glenn Greenwald uh, defending, if you will, um, Tucker Carlson and and the ilk, the right wing ilk of Fox News. Fox News saying that um, when when he said something about the socialists. Uh, Tucker Carlson is more socialist than whatever he said. I don't remember the exact quote, but he felt that they were trying to shave the rough edges away of neoliberalism. Do you guys agree with that uh, analysis of Greenwald? So I think that um, I think that the American if you come up in American politics, there's a extremely strong association between a certain kind of market fundamentalism and conservative politics. And the uh, defining structure of the American conservative movement was this kind of trilateralism um, between uh, libertarians on economics, Christian conservatives on values and um, military hawks on uh, foreign policy. That has broken down partly because the libertarians won and they won in both parties. And so they don't need the Republicans anymore and they got what they wanted in terms of a reorganization of the economy. But the Christian conservatives are discovering that they're the ones paying some of the costs, they're, they're hit by the uh, marketization as much as anybody else. And the continental conservative tradition, especially, ha is much more about aligning economic systems with the preservation of national identity, national culture, traditional forms of um, hierarchy, sometimes religion as well, and is willing to 
be much more interventionist to ensure that the material structure is shoring up that conservative society. And I think that Tucker Carlson, Trump, Boris Johnson, uh, they're coming back to that model where economics is not the end. It's not the purpose to get those tax cuts. It's a means to shore up power, maintain order, and uh, put yourself in the dominant position in the society. So they're willing to go a lot further than even uh, mainstream Democrats in proposing um, advantageous and popular uh, economic packages that will play into their uh, political um, success. Like, and Pascal, you said that um, they're going to push these policies in order to grow their own movement, grow their own base, increase support. And people right now in the US, especially with the uh, post pandemic, the gutting of benefits, uh, healthcare, retirement, the uh, inflationary bubble that's building, the increased cost of housing. Everyone needs some kind of economic support. Everyone needs some kind of package. And it's occurred to the Trump, Tucker Carlson people that if they're the ones offering it, then they can lock in the support of a lot of people who just don't care about politics that much. Um, and it's not even limited to white working class Americans. Trump had the biggest gains you've pointed out. Um, Pascal before among Black Americans that uh, rep any Republican has has ever seen. Probably since Hoover. I mean, yeah, Hoover I mean, and Ho and Hoover was not a modern Republican. He was still like party yeah. of Lincoln. Um, yeah, and I mean, and you can see examples of this in the UK as well, where there there are the intellectual resources that maybe half forgotten. But of one nation Tories, of what used to be kind of the ruling ideology, at least amongst the Tory party, uh, before the Thatcher revolution, right? So this idea of the, the conservatives being the party of, of patriotic workers, of middle class, as well as the elite, um, really kind of representing a whole cross section of society is something that, you know, kind of wrapped up in a patriotic flag. Uh, although obviously the appeals of patriotism are much weaker today than they were, you know, uh, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, uh, that but able to offer some alleviation to the the crises of neoliberalism. So yeah, we talk. We've already talked about cash transfers, and that's kind of an obvious case where you don't even have to build out the infrastructure for the social infrastructure for a welfare state. And this is why I don't think they'll be able to ever deliver even a light social democracy. But they will be able to kind of innovate some new forms of. Uh, well, effective, maybe even innovate some sort of clientelistic politics where they're able to just literally transfer people money and that'll be enough to, to buy them off, right? Um, <laughs> because the alternative is the kind of punitive uh, and uh, impoverishing politics of neoliberalism. And I agree that the, the right is much less ideologically wedded to neoliberalism. In fact, the, the last ones holding the neoliberal candle are the liberal left. <laughs> I think, you know, they, they're going to be the last man standing and something we argue in the book that kind of looking at the new ideological configuration over the last over the next five to 10 years is that the, the kind of hardcore neoliberals will be the kind of liberals with their identity, you know, kind of woke identity politics from above and uh, and, and holding on to, to the market. And so one form that they they might also, incidentally, I think, be able to adopt forms of cash transfer or forms of UBI, which are increasingly popular, which I think are um, quite scary, actually, and I, th I know it has a lot of enthusiasm on the left, but I think it can be quite a dangerous idea because it be, can be very disempowering. Um, basically, it doesn't give you as a worker any leverage anymore if you're no longer employed and just now receiving checks from the state. Um, right, but so, the, so, the le so the left might be able to do that, but the right will also be able to do that. And, you know, you can see the discussions going on at a more intellectual level uh, on the American right at places like American Affairs, which is, I have to full disclosure, I've written for them. Um, and I do think they publish interesting things. Uh, the American Conservative as well, another magazine, where they're they're kind of abandoned neoliberalism in a much more thoroughgoing way than um, maybe some kind of more center-left outlets in the US. So I think that's a very important 
intellectual development that's going on, which has real ideological and political consequences, where we can't just be like, oh, it's it's like the the like it always was that the right or the Republicans or the Conservative Party in the UK are the hardcore neoliberals and the left are kind of a bit anti-neoliberal. There is a realignment going on. No, when we when we were at the uh, Oxford presentation that Jason and I did yesterday, uh, that we were very happy to discuss. Uh, we talked about class and black politics, but there was one of the panelists, but we were the panelists, one of the uh, observers mm -hmm. who made a very interesting statement. His, his specialty was in finance, and he was stating to us that in reading all of the kind of high echelon policy papers coming out of real finance, the, cons the consensus is across the board, neoliberalism has got to go. It's 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 you know mm. we sh they you know we shot our wad with this we've got to find a new a new alternative. No one knows what the new alternative is, but basically the belief in hyper marketization, hyper privatization, and plus austerity, without any kind of uh, state subsidy or benefit to the population, has kind of according to what he's telling us found a consensus in those ranks to say we can't do this anymore now my my question is that are they realizing that i think one of the things he said is that uh, this is not because they're, they're doing this out of any kind of form of generosity it's that austerity is bad for business in other words is that there's still a need for Subsidiz subsidization of business and consumerism. You've got to keep consumerism churning. And if you simply have cutting all social policy and state subsidies to the population with no stimulus, while you privatize state services, whether it be schools or otherwise, and also cut taxes, no revenue going into the government, government and at the same time, you have central banks who are just basically churning money into the economy through quantitative easing. You don't, you're not developing a consumer base. All you're doing is doing a wealth transfer from banks to the securities traded companies, pretty much. And from central banks. From central banks, right? From central banks. And what we're seeing now. People are talking about how we have all these kind of record share, you know, shareholder margins in the stock market. But everyone is realizing that the only reason why the shares of companies in the Dow is so high is not because people are buying stock, it's because there are massive stock buybacks in all of these companies. They're, they're literally buying up their own shares, hoarding them to maintain profitability for their shareholders and their boards of directors. Uh, it's not it's not to maintain profitability it's actually a cash out the um and that's uh, which is a lot more disturbing because the um that means that all of these corporate executives want to take the money now right that the they believe that things will get worse for them in uh, being able to cash out in the future. So you buy back the stock now when it's high, when your tax regime is still uh, very advantageous um, because you're going to need that cash to build your bunker, build the airstrip, pay for the private school, pay for the private hotel, a uh, private, ho private hospital. Um, and you can't rely on the system to maintain the value of your um, financial assets the in perhaps too um as part of the neoliberal project playing itself out we're seeing a type of hyper financialization leading to definancialization uh, and this is just an idea i'm playing with so forgive me if it's not entirely um well developed but when i looked at blackrock and hedge funds going into private uh, residential real estate, right? The conversion of um, private equity, high financial power into a very personal human scale um, power relationship over tenants 
right? Now you have to manage actual residents. Now you have to actually do work with these assets that you own rather than passively letting them accrue value. That bodes a very ill shift away from that hands off end of history management of uh, the economy and, and people through markets to a more direct and naked power relationship um, of landlords and peasants. Wow. Oh, we have a <clears throat> very uh, generous super chat by Landrew Landrew. I don't know. We, the, oh, we just lost the super chat. What happened to the super chat? <laughs> I was reading the super chat and it just disappeared. Oh, here it is. I don't know we the left have any power. I, would, I know we the left don't have any power whatsoever when and if the DOD budget is reduced by a dollar. I'll know we'll have any power when the DOD budget is reduced by a dollar. Shut. Thank you, Andrew, for that super chat. I, absolutely correct, right? The one of the methods of that transfer from central banks into uh, the uh, haute bourgeoisie and sort of like favored uh, groups in the United States is through the military industrial complex. And that demands an ever larger outlay of public funds. I mean, what's also interesting, of course, is that, you know, the state isn't setting up new state owned enterprises, right? So the, it's not doing direct management of, of the economy in any way. Even dirigisme is probably too big a term for what's going on right now. What you have is, yeah, this money printer goes brr is basically, you know, a form of uh, a, a, a massive upward transfer of wealth, asset price inflation. And so, you know, if you own assets, you're you're getting very wealthy. Um, and to a certain extent, maybe the state is playing a more active role in contracting out services. So perhaps, for example, um, I mean, this probably happens anyway in the US, but in, in the, like British context, for example, looking more for British companies to provide services rather than foreign companies, right? So it's making kind of domestic purchasing agreements and so on. So, okay, that's a little bit of a shift and it makes makes a little bit, marks a little bit of a shift away from globalization and the high like peak neoliberalism, but it's baby steps. And the other thing, if we're looking beyond uh, the core capitalist world is that neoliberalism seems to continue unabated. So while there might be like a shift away from neoliberalism or towards state capitalism uh, for the rich world, uh, everywhere else it's still the the whip of neoliberalism and you know i mean looking at things in brazil there doesn't seem to be much of a shift away from it in fact uh, the left is going to be fully neoliberal you know I, if uh, lula wins the next election as looking likely at the moment he, there's talk of him running with his erstwhile opponent of the neoliberal center right so you know neoliberalism isn't doesn't look dilma like did? isn't that What's what dilma that? did uh, alex isn't that what dilma did alex Basically, yeah, it's going to be a replay of that, albeit with a weaker, with a weaker uh, vice president who might not be able to overthrow her. But I mean, it's going to be a disaster, right? So you know, this is where anti-fascism leads, right? Of the kind of liberal anti-fascism, where anything goes, and and suddenly you find yourself defending what you thought was indefensible in what you thought was indefensible only 10, 15 years before, um, and so that backsliding is really terrible. Um, and just you know, at an economic level as well, you know, the, the degree to which there's a shift away from neoliberalism in the kind of semi periphery of the world. I'm not I'm not convinced on that. I mean, things might be a little bit more stable than they were a little while ago, you know, the kind of emerging what's being called the Wall Street consensus, um, which there's more capital about and if you borrow in your own currency, you're okay, or you know, there's all these dollars slashing about and it all works as long as the US doesn't raise into interest rates. Um, but, you know, it's still a pretty precarious situation. And, um, you know, I would to bring up one other thing, I guess, and to bring it back to politics, is that you've had this whole sequence of revolts against neoliberalism and the delegitimation of political classes and political establishments all over the world. And we forget because this crazy fucking thing that's happened called the pandemic um, and the responses to the pandemic and the lockdowns and everything have kind of fried all our brains. But if you cast your mind back to the end of 2019, there were revolts all over the place. It was like Iraq, Lebanon, Chile, Colombia, etc. Right? Um, things going on in the U.S. and in, in Western Europe, the Gilets Jaunes, the, the Yellow Vest in France, and so on. And so there was a kind of worldwide moment of revolt against uh, against neoliberalism in, in various different shapes and sizes. 
Um, where does that leave us now? Has that kind of has that fire kind of bur been burned out, been extinguished by the pandemic? I don't know. I think it's an important question that we should ask ourselves, kind of looking forward at what's at what's coming up. My worry is that the lockdowns, which effectively were massive demobilizations of of, of people, um, stay at home. You know, even if you think it's a justified policy for combating the pandemics, and I think I. I'm increasingly skeptical of that there was ever a, 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 a kind of efficacious response. But anyway, I don't want to get into that. What I want to say is that, you know, stay at home is always going to be demobilizing and de-radicalizing and depoliticizing. Uh, where does that leave us now? Has that has those fires burned out? What I think w w may happen is that that whole experience will lead to even less trust in political establishments. And so we might get kind of even crazier politics coming up where uh, the, the the claims of the elites are not only challenged on a political level, but challenged even on an epistemic level, right? That not only like we disagree with what you're saying, but we don't believe what you're saying. The, 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 the kind of factual basis of what you're saying is is completely bunk. And I think we're seeing that with a lot of, you know, obviously with like QAnon and things like that, the kind of crazier end of it. But I think we might see it as a much more kind of widespread phenomenon. So what we're living in is but kind of a revolutionary or proto-revolutionary situation without a revolution. And that doesn't mean that a revolution is around the bend or something. I'm not being like, you know, comrades, we're, let's take arms because it's, he, it's here and now. What I'm saying is that we don't have the ideas or the organizations to carry out a revolution, despite the fact that objectively we live in a, a practically a proto-revolutionary situation. If the same sequence of events were to have happened 60 years ago, let alone 100 years ago, there would be global yes. revolution. And that's what's I, I, so I, kind of paradoxical about the moment. Well, I think the thing that's more dangerous is that the, the the energy of insurrection and rebellion is with the right, not the left. Yeah. And I, yeah. to answer your question about the the where we are with COVID, there are there are rebellions, particularly in Europe, on various parts of the U.S., but it's against COVID mandates. Yeah. It's it, the people are organizing there's a, there's seriously. There's there's a large pushback here, especially in California, because there's there's some kind of heavier policies. I do want to ask this question as, as time is starting to get a little later, and we've kept uh, Alex longer than we told him um, we we're going to keep him. And it's hard to virtually kidnap people like we always try to do. Um, but MIDI doctors from the UK uh, ask, how is climate change going to play into all of this? Uh, if I may. Um... I think that the climate change, uh, the issues related to climate change are one going to make um, printing money and doing a, a kind of Keynesian mass distribution scheme much more uh, attractive and palatable because um, the crisis gives a, a cover for large scale public spending and like you actually you really do need it i mean i think that you'll get the spending without the infrastructure the spending without the the utility but um the climate response does call for a substantial social investment and it'll make that um keynesian redistribution uh easier and we'll see who gets it depending on who's in charge uh, i also think that it's going to move more people from the uh, kid gloves, we manage you through market structures and behavioral nudges, um, zone of control to the much harsher, uh, more repressive uh, means-tested policies, um, show me your papers, um, Department of Homeland Security, welfare reform. Um, you know, base of the of the pyramid of control. I think that with the climate change issue, and I said this on our episode when we talked about American decline, I think that the climate change is going to be managed as a boost to capitalism. It's going to be shock doctrine capitalism on steroids. I think that the right is going because it's going to be a point where they're going to realize, okay, we got, we got, we got, we got to take this somehow. And I think the right or even the liberals will turn it into a business opportunity, whether it be, you know, uh, you know, uh, green businesses or solar panels or whatever, they will turn it into a massive, massive capitalist kind of 
boondoggle, boondoggle that may have some job growth behind it, but I don't see it necessarily as a palliative to the actual problem. I see it as really as an opportunity to be like, let's make some money off of this. Like Theranos, but for climate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, climate change worries me a great deal. The capitalist responses to climate change worry me even more because I think without a democratization and without a shift, uh, even a small shift in the balance of class forces, the fight against climate change will be a punitive one against the working class. And you can see this, I think there was a proposal, where did I see this? A news article saying, you know, that there's a growing kind of consensus around individual carbon limits, right? So as if that each individual is somehow equally responsible for climate change, which one is wrong, because obviously it's the richest people in richest countries who emit the most carbon emissions. But secondly, that individualist framing of it is completely, you know, completely mistaken uh, as well, because of course there's, there's in specific industries which are greatly polluting. And secondly, I mean, those industries, or thirdly, those industries sometimes are things that we need for, for production, right? So it's not as if like turning it into this moral question of like you've exceeded your limits is completely irrational because we should be looking at it rationally, right? So climate change is very damaging to the possible to, to, to future human civilization, right? Okay, so what's a, what's a good way to do that? Well, one is an energy transition and, you know, renewables might be useful in certain specific cases where, for example, you have a country with can depend on hydropower if you're Iceland. But for most countries, that isn't the case. And the most reliable uh, green and on the long run, cheap energy uh, provision is nuclear. And the fact nuclear. that no one wants to do nuclear, the fact that no one wants to seriously do nuclear, although France, uh, Macron, uh, someone I really hate and who's practically the devil, but you know, and who embodies so many of our degenerate uh, contemporary politics, he at least has now signed into law uh, a plan for rolling out more nuclear. So that's at least a good thing. Nuclear, why does nuclear, which it seems such an open goal in terms of uh, one major solution to climate change, why does that not get favor? It's because it's a kind of um, being hit from both sides by environmentalists on the one hand who are deeply skeptical of any kind of mass engineering project, even one which I mean, has the possibility also, to really reduce carbon emissions, and neoliberals. Fukushima. Well, but exactly, but no one died from Fukushima. You know, the, the, what, what, what caused Fukushima was a massive earthquake and tsunami. Um, and, you know, so like the, the, the case of Fukushima was not a nuclear disaster, right? Um, and the there's, radiation there's a giant exclusion deaths. zone where no one can live. Yeah, but that, it, it, that was particularly because of the ways that it was built. But the case, the, 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 there is no, the way I'm modern not... reactors are made, they're very safe. And the problem of nuclear waste is something that we can absolutely deal with. And there'll be the technology in the future to reuse that fuel. The issue is, is that the reason why it's not done is because of the market bias. Uh, because it would demand huge amounts of state investment because the private sector doesn't want to build that out. And so here you have really the, the, the kind of nub of the neoliberal failure to provide any response to climate change is that it washes its hands or, or kind of rules out of hand the possibility of building up nuclear, which is a real solution. And at the same time, looks to punitive individuals uh, responses where it goes, tries to limit people's individual carbon emissions as if that's the root of the problem. It's partly it partly has to do with the the type of state that you end up after 20 30 years of neoliberalism you yeah have expertise in managing pop populations through these technocratic systems like um, credit scores or uh, drug testing um, and uh, individual carbon tracking metric would fit very comfortably inside of that apparatus the people who could run large-scale public investments uh, projects that could build up nuclear or or other type of uh, energy infrastructure they either have all migrated to the private sector or um, they're in all of the wrong places in the public system of administration and policy making and I'm much more agnostic about nuclear power. I think that there's a case to be made that this could be a very, um, this could be a good solution, but the technical concerns that people have in preventing another Fukushima or Chernobyl are legitimate, right? Like that is, that is a potential downside. And that's something that I think um, any plan to go with nuclear needs to have front and center a response to. 
Well, all right. I think oh, we, oh. we have. Can I just uh, ask one question and um, maybe, you know, uh, Alex, you could answer it just, just as briefly as, um, or as, or at length, depending on how you like, but um, if the end of history is really over, then was there ever a moment where do you, you think that that project could have succeeded and it could have gone on? Or was this doomed from the start as a, um as a fundamental misreading of how change happens in history whether the end of history as a project could have continued indefinitely is that the question yeah could it have could have things worked out for neoliberalism and globalization in a way that would have um justified fukuyama or i don't think so. no I, I i don't think so i mean you know obviously to a certain extent you know to what extent is the end of history truly truly over right um, there are lingering elements of it. So even if a lot of the planks of it have dissipated or, or are seriously under threat, so you can think of like globalization, okay, there's a, a recoil from that. Globalism, the whole ideology of flattening and, you know, the kind of instant world and whatever, that, you know, has gone. Neoliberalism, as we've discussed already, is kind of being eroded from within. Uh, the post-political kind of technocratic management politics, that's something that's also gone. And the other element, and this is the fifth element, I would say, of the end of history, and this is one that is still with us, which is capitalist realism, you know, to use Mark Fisher's term, which is the inability to even imagine an alternative to capitalism. And I think that we're still kind of with, because all our imaginings are about things getting worse or worse dystopias, or at least holding back from the worst things happening. That's the, the, the sum total of our ambition. So in that regard, we're still, we still live in the world after the defeat of socialism, after the defeat of the working class. And that defeat is something that, of course, is not just something that happened suddenly in 1989, right? That defeat is something that happens, you know, depending on the way you look at it, in the early 1920s or in the 1930s with fascism, with the Second World War, um, with the defeat of the attempt at a new left in the 1960s, right? So there's a, a sequence of, of defeats. But what is uh, unique, I guess, about the 1989 moment and the the, the Fukuyama in uh, you know end of history period is this defeat of politics itself. So that you don't just have the defeat of the possibility of revolution or of socialism, but the defeat even of social democratic politics. And what's interesting is that you needed the revolution, the threat of revolution, and the and the existence, the, the as an existing example the, of the USSR, however degenerated that was. Um, as a threat to uh, ruling elites that allowed a limited form of politics to happen, right? So like what underpinned the possibility of social democracy was the threat of communism. And without that, then you can't just, you can't just re reform social democracy out of nothing. That isn't really answering your question in a way, um, because it really it's kind of saying that, well, the end of history seems to still be with us. Um, and to a certain extent, I, the, you know, the, the jury's still out on that and it won't be resolved until there is a genuine system alternative that, that emerges to challenge that. So, you know, we're not saying that history has re-begun. You know, that isn't the case. What you have is politics kind of returning to the scene in the form of dissensus, always in a negative sense, in a way of more breakdown than something new emerging, but it offers a, a chink of light, right? And so in, in that situation, um, you have to live with this uncertainty. It's the end of the end of history. It's not the rebirth of uh, the rebirth of something new. And that's the, the kind of world we live in. And that's why it, everything is so particularly confusing in this moment. So, you know, at least in the book, we try to provide hopefully a little bit of clarity around that. The internal contradictions of capitalism would have not allowed the end of history to continue. That's that's what my answer is. It was going to crash. And it did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Alex, uh, thank you for, for giving us more of your time than you had originally uh, promised. Uh, I am very sad we did not get to talk uh, anti-politics and the end of history and when G.I. Joe made the pivot to stop fighting Cobra and fight eco-terrorism. <laughs> A real I'm, enemy. I'm, I'm actually, like, I had a whole fucking question around that and like the rise of shitty shows like jackass and 
Oh, well, so, l l let me let me go back and, and re-examine my notes on that. And then we can do that another time because that sounds a lot like uh, a lot of fun. Yes, yes. I know you are not from the States, but I know um, it wasn't G.I. Joe where you were. It was uh, Action Force. Uh, no, I don't know. I don't know what that is. <laughs> what is it? What was it called? Gene, if Gene Bajlan was here, he knows because he's he's from Hull. And he knew he knew action for it was literally the same thing as G.I. Joe. They just changed uh, a few of the things. And I forget you, they didn't fight a bit less, a bit less macho, maybe a bit more British or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah they stopped for tea. Uh, but yeah, I definitely look forward to having that uh, that fun uh, pop culture conversation with you. But uh, th thank you. Th and also definitely get into the weeds with music with you as well. Um, I definitely want to talk with you about music's role in in all of this that we that we are discussing. So Fantastic. I want you back. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Let's do that. Let's do that. I've had a huge amount of fun. I thought this was really uh, interesting and like great points from you guys as well, which uh, things which certain angles to questions that I hadn't thought of. So great stuff. Great stuff. I enjoyed this. Thank you very so, much, Alex. Very much. I learned quite a, pleasure. quite a bit. Cheers. It was very enjoyable. There's links in the description to Alex's book. The end of the end of history out right now is out now, isn't it? It's out. It's been out. Yeah, yeah. No, it's all, in all good and bad bookshops. Where's the best? <laughs> where's the, the best? Of the history. Also, and I and I apologize for not saying this when I introduced you. You are part of the Bunga Bunga podcast as well. That's right. Yeah, at Bunga Cast, uh, wherever you want to find us, or BungaCast.com. There's also links anywhere you, you buy your bungas. <laughs> So, so thank you, Alex, and you have a great rest of your day in uh, in Sao Paulo. Cheers. Peace. Thank you. I uh, I want to. I should have also asked Alex about uh, my horrible hamburger experience in San pa Sao Paulo, where I did not understand the, how to order a hamburger in Brazil, and I'm still. <laughs> miffed at what they gave me alex goes i want to talk <laughs> all caps all caps but you know he's serious okay <laughs> let's go now the serious stuff starts let's go so alex alex i wasn't in sao paulo at this point i was in florinopolis okay and we had, we had just played a show and there was a burger place across the street from the venue and i and i don't i don't eat before I play. So I asked our tour manager who was, who was Brazilian and I said, uh, is that place going to be open? And he goes, yeah, it should be open. And it wasn't open when we were done with the, with the show, but there was another little stand next to it. And I ordered a burger and then, you know, make a long story short, so many things were on this burger. It, it was like baby corn and fucking chickpeas <laughs> and ham, yeah. everything, but cheese and motherfucking meat. So, <laughs> was this like a vegan a vegan burger or what? what no, did you end up with? The but the the bitch part about it was they had a picture. So you know how they have like stock photos of shit on the menus, yeah. and so the menu had a stock photo of a juicy ass looking like bacon cheeseburger, and I was like, I want that. And the guy I said, Mara burger. I got it was some because you got to order is either hamburger or americano or some shit. I forget. But I I didn't order the right one. And he was like, you want everything? And he said it in, in Portuguese. And yeah. I was like, yeah, everything. That'll be a she's tudo. So that like a she's like is literally like an X, the letter X, but it sounds like cheese. So it's like a cheeseburger yeah. and tudo is just everything, right? So it's like a cheese everything. And so yeah. I don't know what everything you had at that specific uh, place in Florianopolis or what they offer, but I'm familiar with the concept and i have to say i stand firmly against it this is a trait that brazil shares to a certain extent with the united states which is to make everything very large and add fucking every ingredient to it and so uh yeah i'm not a fan and often the the kind of balance of flavors and acidity is all kind of out of whack you should try the hot dogs here because next time you're here I'll, I'll take you for a terrible hot dog where there's all sorts of things there's mashed potatoes in it right mashed potatoes inside the hot dog you get a kind of creamy white cheese as well as some sort of 
cheddar, you know, like which you have in the States as well, kind of fake cheddar. You have uh, peas in there often, and then you have like matchstick potatoes and a bunch of other stuff. Um, yeah, we have a lot better food. I don't want to say that, you know, I don't want to portray Brazil as having a terrible culinary culture. There's actually really great, interesting things from different states, but uh, its interpretation of the hot dog is, uh, and, and for that matter, the cheeseburger is the best uh, we have to offer. Yeah, a That's lot of it. good food cultures, there's one or two things that they import from abroad that they just don't get, right? <laughs> like, and you can eat everything but the stuff from home, basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, know, you could just serve it in a bucket and it would you know basically come oh. out the same so yeah, kentucky kentucky fried chicken like um get one of them but that's just buckets. fried chicken in a bucket but i'm saying you know peas and frankfurter and bread and there's, cheese. there's you what you do is you request all of the sides but poured into the bucket with the chicken and that sounds like it might replicate wow. your experience yeah it was it was it was so odd to eat and when it came out, I just remember my my drummer and he had brought his his girlfriend on this tour, and uh, they they walked over and they saw me and they just they couldn't stop laughing. Like we just couldn't stop laughing at the absurdity of stuff that wasn't meat and cheese that was on the burger with everything. And that guy looked at me and he looked at me like, "Okay, motherfucker, I'm finna give you everything." And I was like, "Yeah, I'm thinking grilled onions and shit." And uh, oh, did I learn my lesson? Yeah, I mean, you made yeah, the mistake like, of not being extremely hungover or extremely drunk at that moment, yeah. presumably, presuming that you weren't, because that I'm is the target drunk. market for that. And yeah, I, I am it, stone cold okay. sober, so I made that decision with a sober mind. Yeah, but yeah, like um, this is this is good. There's um, all kinds of minefields out there when you're uh, ordering food in Brazil, eh? Um, you know, so, someone asked us at the dog meat story. We were told that it was cat meat. And uh, no, that is not the cat meat story where we're eating street meat, walking around it's, Sao Paulo. It's dangerous to start to talk about hamburgers and fast food chains um, on this show because uh, it'll turn into a, a like, you, you might have started another podcast. <laughs> I've been looking for another project to just talk <laughs> and rant about food. So if anybody's interested in doing that, I'm I'm game. <laughs> between between the conversation and this chat, I can't stop fucking laughing. I you know what, man? I I enjoy eating in in foreign countries. I don't know about you guys, Pascal. Do you enjoy when you travel? eating in foreign countries if they have good food yeah uh, do you keep halal uh i i for a while i, I don't i don't dine one of the swine in that context mm. i don't get down the, with the, uh, the pigness because well, that would I mean, be really you're funny missing out but that's okay <laughs> can you imagine trying to it's bad enough traveling with people that are lactose intolerant Oh, if vegans. Travel. Imagine traveling. Oh, vegans. it's my oh, only weakness. Know. I am, I, I am otherwise perfect, but I am lactose intolerant. <laughs> that doesn't stop me. That does no not case. stop me from consuming dairy. I'm not going to let no, anything no stop me from eating everything that the world has to offer. Uh, so, I fucking love it, dude. Well, shit, Alex, we we we're bringing you back. Just you tell us when you're free again. We're bringing you back. Delighted. Del Any time. Do you do this on a Saturday? Saturday? That's a Saturday afternoon. Saturday for me, so. we do this crazy Great. shit a little Perfect. longer. Because I definitely, again, I want to get into the pop culture uh, aspect of, of what you guys were writing about. And I'm kind of sad that um, we didn't get into it. But I want to hear more from you about that because I'm I'm really interested. You wrote, you sent me this thing that you wrote. I thought it was fantastic about uh, kind of punk and everything. And like, I, I don't know that much. So I'd love to learn more about that and try to understand that um angle of it a bit more of where you know kind of popular culture and music specifically ties in uh ties in with uh you know i guess the shrinking of historical horizons i, I was uh, you know real quick before i before i uh let you go 
last Thursday, we do a live stream on Thursday. We have a, a we usually keep it, uh, we do the first hour and then we keep the second time, the, the, the extra time behind a paywall. And our behind a paywall discussion, we actually got into the weeds on um, hip hop. And you touch a little bit on hip hop in your in your book, a little bit. And I was like, oh man, I wish I was fucking there with him when he was right. <laughs> we could have really <laughs> got into the to the weeds on. I, I on had that. to crowdsource that bit because my knowledge of hip hop is so limited that I had to crowdsource that. Like, okay, what are the best examples here of hip hop losing any sort of political edge and just becoming consumerist or nihilistic? So. I, I put that so in my part in my the piece that I sent you 84 is a big pivotal year right you know it's this it's the Reagan second election it's kind of defeated this genre and so for part two a 94 is a very big year it's the death of Kurt Cobain you know you talk about that a lot in your in your work as well but it's also the birth of Green Day and the birth of pop punk and it's also a time for you know massive uh, dereg financial deregulation in the states uh, that allows for uh, you know, banks to eat up the savings and loans and um, start, we start to see the eroding of the glass Steagall uh, regulation that, you know, finally by 99, it's, it's all the way gone. And so for me, musically 94, I, I find to be a very interesting year um, as Cobain succumbs to, you know, addiction and, you know, the, the, the fighting contradiction he's constantly having internally and then sadly kills himself. What then happens to that genre? Where does hip hop go around that same time? Uh, I also feel that, you know, maybe it's around 91, uh, 92, uh, that we see hip hop take a, a huge turn to not, they're no longer the street reporters. Remember that, Pascal? We're not rappers, we're street reporters. We're reporting the news. We're like the hood CNN. And that's what everybody was. And then by the time the chronic comes out, they're no longer reporting on the street and they're just selling a lifestyle. And the chronic for me and, and Illmatic are lifestyle brands, um, uh, hip hop albums. It's an interesting premise with some merit, a lot of merit. So we we uh, got into the weeds <laughs> on the podcast talking about about all this, and there was an aspect that you talked about as well that I didn't really get into, which was the repetitive nature of dance music and the blowing up. Of yeah, I was kind of pissed about that because you took a shot at house music. I was like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I'm I'm whoa. I'm a huge fan of house music, but you know, I think it does. You can read it, I think, in that way. In, in I can't. I extent. can't read. Maybe not music. house music from the '80s. I was talking more about techno, to be fair. I was thinking more oh, about techno. Kind of techno is, is, there's the a 90s. difference between techno and house music. The, the Brits use it differently. Oh, I know. It's a little oh, like, I know. They call it garage. They call it garage. Garage. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, you know, as a person that I've actually worked, I, I do. I did finance stuff at the at the bigger festivals, so working at the largest uh, EDM festival in the states. It was interesting to to read your commentary about dance music. Um, I, I, like I think that um, Starship Troopers is in some ways like a fantastic artifact of this period. Um, and putting aside all the militarism, alien, neo reactionary stuff, the it's set in Buenos Aires, but everything is filmed in Los Angeles. So you get the sense that neoliberalism, globalization has won to such a point that every city in the world is Los Angeles, right? That's the end game. That's the real end of history. And then the little cultural details, uh, for instance, at their prom, they're listening to this sort of lo-fi um, electronic music. And like you said about dance music, no beginning, no end. Also, if you listen closely, the lyrics are just like, everything is fine. You're doing okay. Just keep dancing. Everything is fine. Yeah. Um, and there's, there was that um, sort of uh, narc 
narcotizing effect of pop culture in the 90s going along with the demobilization like you it, a lot of it was just about like feeling good and not thinking about things yeah and that's a lot of and there's also today, this... right it's about tonight and that's about the the, the limit of it right by the time that uh, the iPod comes into existence and we're able to put large amounts of our uh, music collections on one device and shuffle, um, what becomes interesting to me as well is the fact that music starts to be made to ignore. And yeah. with with the kind of blow up of IDM music, you know, intelligent dance music and, and all that other, you know, chill wave and all this other stuff that I, I enjoy, you know, I enjoy playing music in the background to all my tasks, but, and, and, and again, we always talk about is music really a revolutionary force? And I you know, wouldn't say it's a revolutionary force, but there's something to be said about how you felt playing full records and and the, and the feeling you felt when you had when you went to go pick through the records or the CDs or the tapes at the at the shop that you bought your music at, and the person that um, helped curate your tastes when you were a younger person and was like, "Hey, what's the new blah 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 I want to go get?" And now all that's done for you with well, algorithms. Yeah exactly like that person has been um brain scanned um, mm -hmm. reduced to uh their essential components and uploaded so that they may permanently and perpetually give you album recommendations and it, it's just it's it's so it's someone asked a question in the chat about toro y moi um i used to know that guy because he practices at the at the studio um yeah, I would call them chill wave. They were so quiet. We didn't even know they were there half the time. You should never be in a band and I not know you're there. <laughs> Practicing in a loud ass warehouse. But there, yeah, that, that 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 whole thing about dance music to me and the repetitive nature of it, and then you know the apolitical nature of shows like Jackass and the rise of of reality television is is definitely what I'm trying to to write about. And and I'm not joking when i say i'm going to send you an email about what i'm thinking because <laughs> i want you to help me with these thoughts alex i'm not fucking around Do it. i'm looking forward to it yeah that's good that's good it'll make me listen to more music because i've been so bad at even listening to music recently i don't know what's happened to me so um, maybe that'll encourage me to, to kind of go back and listen to some things Dude, I'm still listening to the same people from Bristol that came out in the 90s before the show started. <laughs> the massive attack before we went live. So it's it's good stuff. I, I I can't even I can't I can hardly recommend like contemporary things because I I just think that there's so little that's good. But that might just be me showing my age. You know, it's that thing you're like, hmm, this is a deep historical insight about our present moment, or maybe it's just the fact that I'm in my mid 30s. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Rock says, and Pascal always backs this up, whatever you were listening to when you first started fucking is the music you're going to listen to for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah. The, I'm, yeah. I'm not willing to reveal anything about my musical taste uh, unless there's a patron paywall up. So, uh, <laughs> pleading the One. fifth. That's why Pascal loves house music, man. I did a lot of things to house music. <laughs> and he's not talking about macrame. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right, Alex. I'm going to let you go, brother. Nice one, guys. Really enjoy that. Take Peace care. Out. See you later. Bye-bye. That's funny. Um, I did find Marcus. I did find Marcus. Um, hold on one second. I'm going to share my screen. I found him. And uh, you know he's a Marine, right? Yep. He's yeah. mentioned that before. And uh, Veterans Day was... Um, two days Veterans ago. Day was recently and apparently... Um, uh, 
apparently uh, we found Marcus. Oh, come on, man. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I, I agree with Pascal on this. Um, mostly, I'm just relieved because the way that you said it, I'm like, is is this like a bad PTSD story? I am deeply concerned. <laughs> uh, no, Marcus is Marcus is just fine. Yeah. Uh, hold on one second. So we have we have a. Uh, can you hear me, guys? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Are, are we still uh, alive? We do have we do have one more guest coming in. Uh, actually, a friend of mine, also from my alma mater, the Albany High. Is doing a fundraiser for Kashama Sawant. And it's going down in Oakland. And because I can't be in Oakland to uh, be a part of it, I told him, hey, why don't you come on the show and we'll talk about what you guys are doing for Kashama Sawant. But he's having some problems connecting. And some of those problems are my fault. It's of my shoddy internet. Uh, also, I do want to say for patrons uh, that listen to the audio only podcast, we are having an issue with Patreon allowing me to uh, post any sort of MP3s. So once I get that straightened out, uh, I'll have a post. So I wanted to keep you guys aware that I am working that out. So Pascal and Cuba, can you guys have a meeting of the minds? Well, I hate, well, I hate, well, I help Enrique come in. All right. Cuba didn't expect this to be happening. Um, it's becoming a trend. Uh, I feel like he might be queuing us up for a spinoff, or it's some kind that of would like be interesting. I could I see a that. buddy cop um, situation working out. Like, that would be um, interesting. I think I would be the good cop in that paradigm. Well, I, I think we would. Um, well, it'd be we, just bad cop, bad cop. Bad, exactly, bad cop, worst cop. The um and go. we could uh, alternate seasons. So one season we're um like solving crimes in in Miami or you know and it like takes us in an international web of intrigue to Port-au-Prince. We see we get to see Haiti and then the next season is all Polish winter. Oh uh, yeah. So it's always a fish out of water, but um it's never the same person twice. So, Kuba, let me ask you a question while I have you on here, because contrary to what you may believe, I actually do value your insights. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. What do you make about uh, this, what is this, COP26 uh, conference on the environment stuff in terms of what's happening? So, um, the I think that there's a large-scale consensus around the feasibility of doing something right previous environmental conferences the technology hadn't quite matured and the um the urgency was was lacking but right now there are zero uh, carbon neutral uh carbon neutrality pledges in um dozens of countries um uh, written into national law and the um so uh, canada has one um 2040 i think is the is the date that uh, the country is supposed to be climate uh, neutral um uh, two countries bhutan and suriname are already uh, carbon neutral, but um, the China has um, it unilaterally announced 2060 as its uh, year for achieving carbon neutrality. And the cost of renewables has gone down so much so that some combination of renewable technologies plus um, hydrogen fuel plus nuclear where, where it's appropriate and can be done safely could conceivably get you to phase out um, 
fossil fuels for energy generation. And because of the fact that there's so much public money that could be shunted in to Tesla, to um, the Chinese solar and wind farms, to manufacturers all across the world, uh, contracting companies to do the implementation. It's easy to actually get a lot of the capitalist class on board with this because it'll be structured to work through existing companies and enrich people who um, already are are influential. And uh, since it serves their interests, you're not going to necessarily have that kind of opposition to this um, this plan. Um, plans that call for substantial cuts to emissions that just come through um, conservation measures or reduced consumption, those are the ones that are uh, a much harder sell. Uh, I think that the bigger problem with implementing this will be, can you get national level governments and uh, the companies that are will actually do some of the implementation to make it happen and to do it in a way that isn't just plundering, isn't just profiteering. And I'm concerned about the United States, especially because of it, the hollowing out of its governance capability that mm. you're going, you're not going to be able to discipline um, energy producers in Texas and um, China. Their advantage is that if they have a policy commitment that the Communist Party is serious about, uh, every related entity, state, civil society, or corporate is going to work towards its realization rather than trying to sabotage it from within. And that would be my concern about um, the outcome of um, the conference because those pledges need to be made real under the political conditions that exist in different countries. And the United States is very close to being ungovernable where you simply cannot have an effectively implemented large-scale public program regardless of um, regardless of its need regardless of its political valence um, Trump can't the conservatives can't build the wall uh, Democrats can't do anything so you think our level of, the level of uh, lack of governability is come to the point where it's a structural or foundational part of American politics right now, regardless of who's in power. So if they, let's say, you know, the Republicans win, win Congress in the midterms and take the presidency in 2024, are you telling me that their one party rule does not by any stretch of the imagination remedy the governability, governability crisis? So we saw this with Trump in power. There are, um, elements of the deep state that will sabotage any anti-imperial um, leadership or anything that they read as, um, as uh, undermining their self-pointed role as guardians of the world order. The, also, when you look at the money that was pushed out through the public private paycheck, um, uh, the Paycheck Protection Program or uh, other attempts to push relief funding into the economy. The, uh, for instance, like unemployment insurance, the unemployment claims, the systematic disinvestment of state capacity to field those kinds of claims meant that there was unspent billions across the United States even as people desperately needed it and, and were desperately trying to get it. So if the conserve, if you have a Republican uh, consolidation, then it will take them a while to 
um, build up their own bureaucracies, their own apparatus of governance. So I think they'll have to start um, not quite from scratch, but they'll they won't be able to use much of what they inherit because it's been degraded and because the people in it are um, largely left leaning civil servants. Trump was has started the process by buff, uh, by building up the Department of Homeland Security, U.S. Marshals, and especially Customs and Border Patrol as his kind of stormtroopers. So one could imagine that um, they keep going down that route and have the um, Department of Homeland Security be the executive apparatus for actually implementing Republican policy. Because other agencies, they are limited in what they can do, even if they have the backing of um, elected officials, even if the even with the president and the um, and like Congress at their back, CDC, the Department of Energy, the FDA, all bump into uh, real practical obstacles in attempting to um, actually do something positive rather than just distributing money and handing out permissions and um, uh, the, the typical corporate giveaway neoliberal agenda. Hmm. It's definitely something to think about. Yeah, cadres, um, the, a, a person... You know, to quote a great figure that you uh, admire, uh, cadres determine everything. And the political parties in the United States have invested so much into building media and uh, electoral cadres that they don't actually have policy people. And even more importantly, they don't actually have bureaucratic operators. Um, so they're limited in what, they can do with this hollowed out bureaucratic husk that um, looks impressive from the outside. But in reality, the US government requires thousands, tens of thousands of contractors to augment its own workforce just to do what it's supposed to do already. Well, then what you're saying is that basically, regardless of who takes power, there's going to be a crisis, a crisis of governance component that's going to be making any type of actual implementation of policy almost impossible in the United States. Yeah, Simply one, because it, there's total lethargy in yes. the institutional mechanisms of, mechanisms of governance. It, it, I wouldn't, it's not lethargy, it's um, the degeneration or um, the uh, atrophy. Right, like the power has been unused and shelved, and uh, for so long that it's reduced the ability of people to actually um, do their jobs. And I think that one reason why the United States likes sending in the National Guard or doing things through uh, the military is because that's one of the few institutions in the public sector that actually still has solid command and control, its own internal capabilities, it could get big projects done. But um, that's a very dangerous path to, to tread um, and not what's what the military is for anyway. They're not supposed to be doing disaster relief. They're not supposed to be doing uh, public health. Um, but here they are. Well, speaking of relief, I was not able to get Enrique on for whatever reason he couldn't connect through uh, the restream link but because of this handy dandy board I have we have him connected through phone and then I got kicked offline can you guys hear me now yes I got kicked off that's six times I've been kicked off on the show, by the way. Let me uh, close this uh, message board down with Enrique's number on it. <laughs> yeah, please close that down. Enrique, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you guys How's hear Enrique? Yes. Hello. 
how how is the Bay Area Bay. right now? What's the weather like? It's beautiful and sunny today. It's gorgeous. That is that and is my awesome. allergies my allergies reflect that as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh Enrique is all, is another Albany High person, Pascal. There's That's there's right. so many of us that have come over to Albany High. Yeah, we're taking over the world. <laughs> so I have I have your event up on the screen. What is going on, and why does Kashama Sawant need your help? Oh, thank you, first of all, so much for having me on. I'm a, a big fan of this show, long time listener, <laughs> first time caller. Um, and this is also my, uh, my first time ever being a guest on a podcast. So I'm, I'm really excited about this. Um, and I'm very grateful for your generosity. Um, and Socialist Alternative Bay Area, uh, the organization I'm a part of, we're really, really grateful for uh, this opportunity as well. Um, and so we're, I'm here to kind of do a, a 11th hour push for our um, stand-up comedy fundraiser for Shama Sawan. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> she, as, as you and your, your viewers may know, uh, Shama Sawan is the first socialist to be elected to city council uh, in decades and has been enormously successful in using her office to build movements and win concrete victories for the working class. Uh, she was uh, elected in 2013 and re-elected in 2015 and 2019, despite uh, major well-funded opposition. Um, the most recent time in 2019, Amazon actually spent an unprecedented $1.5 million to oppose her, which you know is, is unheard of to pour that kind of money into a city council race. Uh, but they couldn't do it. She won. And so now they're trying to do this do-over. Um, and get rid of her via an undemocratic recall um, attempt, uh, which I can get into a little bit more. But we're trying to raise money to to fight this uh, because she's been such an effective fighter for the working class, and and we can't let them do this. Where can people get tickets? There's a question. Is it on Eventbrite? Yes, it's uh, it's on um, Eventbrite, mm-hmm. and there is I think just a few left. So I don't. I, I really recommend people. Um, Go into the Eventbrite uh, link um, and getting a ticket that's four o'clock today um, at Oak Stop, um, which is on 1721 Broadway next to the 19th Street Bar Station, mm-hmm. um, to make sure that you can get in. Um, and I can I can send you the link. Uh, yeah, send me the, send me the link. Send me the link, Enrique. And okay. I'll, and I'll put okay. it up and have our have our cool. wonderful moderator as well put it up. M. Toussaint, as awesome. soon as you send it to me. Yeah, I'll I'll do that right now. So we've had Kashama uh, Swan on the show. It was actually yeah, I uh, thought that was a good episode. That was a, that was a damn good episode. She, she's a fiery woman. <laughs> she brings the fire. Yeah. <laughs> so who who is all going to be at the show? Can you tell us who all to get? Why does this Great keep question? Up? <laughs> um. So yeah. Uh. So <clears throat> it's going to be. Uh. Let me see here. So the featuring comedian, writer, and union organizer, Nato Green, is the headliner. Okay. And there's going to be uh, fellow comics Marcus Williams and Richard Raya. Um, also in attendance and speaking is uh, progressive Democrat Janani Ramachandran. Oh, um, she's and on the other... show before. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah, she's going to be there uh, speaking and, um, and also some activists from our organization. So, uh, some activists from your organization? Yeah, yeah, for okay. social alternative and the Shama Solidarity campaign. Okay. Well, this sounds fun. I'm again. I'm kind of yeah. I can't be there, man. I know. I know. There's a, a live stream um, that's going to be through the FB uh, page that I can I can send to you too. If that's possible. Yes, please send me the live stream okay. link as well. I'll and send I'm you like that. 27 links. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> Pascal, do you have any any comments on Kashama Sawant? I enjoyed uh, having her as a guest, and I like her energy. She seems very, very motivated. Indeed, indeed. Do a little bit more of kind of enumerating yeah. some of uh, some of her accomplishments, and also kind of pointing out why why anyone outside of Seattle should care. Um, so, first of all, for uh, her victories, they are immense. Um, she's, I would say, far and away the most effective Marxist in, in office. Um, in, in our country. She led the movement for a $15 minimum wage, which was the first in the country in a major city, and that spread like wildfire. 
She uh, led the movement for the Amazon tax, which now gives Seattle uh, $250 million a year for affordable housing and a Green New Deal. Uh, she helped lead BLM protests, um, which led to Seattle becoming the first city in the country to ban police use of chemical weapons and crowd control weapons. Now that, unfortunately, was later rolled back by the less progressive city council. Um, she won renters' rights that forces landlords to give tenants six months' notice if the rent will go up by 10%. Um, and if this rent increases, if, the, if that rent increase um, causes tenants to have to move, uh, landlords will have to pay the tenants three months' rent. Um, she also won a ban on school year evictions. And I think it's pretty safe to say that if she stays in office, it's, it's only a matter of time before Seattle has rent control. So, of course, um, the money and interest want her out. Yes, she's, she's definitely and, and hated. She's hated by. Despised. By the landlord, definitely hated by big business. But I mean, the landlord class definitely hates her because yeah. like her whole platform is definitely on renters' rights to the point where didn't exactly. she? Didn't she? And maybe I'm wrong on this. I can't remember. Didn't she get something passed or was trying to get something passed where you, you they were taking off felony convictions as a question on the rent application? You know, that's a good question. I'm not exactly sure. Okay. Um, you know, because I'm, I'm not in Seattle, so I don't, uh, not quite as much in the weeds, but that's entirely possible. And, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, but you're right. She's, she is a fierce, fierce advocate for, for tenants and, and they know it. And, mm -hmm. and that's why they're trying to get rid of her. And the, um, the recall itself is, is just so gross. Uh, it's a, it's an interesting story. If I could just, yeah. uh, kind of briefly go yeah. into it. So, um, you know, like I said, they're trying to do this do-over. They've tried to um, uh, they've tried to get her out of office, um, doing more traditional, albeit still kind of scummy, <laughs> methods of, of of blocking for re-election. But they haven't been able to do that. So now they're trying uh, to do this recall campaign, which is really part of this nationwide right-wing um, voter suppression uh, tactic that are happening. It does not just happen in the South. Um, it, it's happening, you know, here even in California um, with, with Gavin Newsom, who's not that great at all, um, and with progressive DA, uh, Chase Boudin in San Francisco, who is pretty great, um, that they're trying to recall him in June. Um, you know, we, we knew that this was coming, um, and uh, Sharma said, look, if you're going to do this, at least make it as fair as possible and try to put it on the November election ballot, the general election ballot, that's where mm -hmm. everybody yeah. votes, you know, or, or more people vote. And they, they have the signatures. Um, and in fact, she said, you know what, Where where's the petition? Where's the petition to, to put my recall on the ballot? I'll sign it. I'll sign it. I want to make sure that you guys can get this in in time. So she signed her own <laughs> wow. uh, petition to get her recall. And she said, you know what, I'll do even better than that. Um, we will go out and collect signatures for you. Mm -hmm. We will, how many do you need? Like a thousand, two thousand, you need a little cushion. We'll go out and get those for you just to make sure that you don't try to bury this, um, that you put this on the November election ballot. Um, and so, you know, Social Culture in Seattle, they got the, they got the signatures, they turned them into the recall campaign and they, they sat on it. <laughs> I mean, with that off move. Um, and so despite having plenty of time to turn them in by I think like the August deadline. Um, they showing absolutely no shame. They refuse to turn them in. And now we're looking at a special election on December seventh. Um, which turn out to December be about twenty five you said? Yeah, that's right. That's that's what I said. Wow. As in between the two biggest holidays in the US, Thanksgiving and, and Christmas. Christmas. Um, so even if you don't back it in between those two <laughs> uh, dates Special turnout elections tend to be 25 to 50 percent lower, and you have to ask yourself, ask yourself, why? Why would the recall want this? Well, they want lower turnout, um, and lower turnout means fewer, fewer people like us, working class people, young people, people of colors, and renters voting. And these are the exact same people who got Shama elected in the last, you know, these last three times. They want to really disempower them. Uh, so it's 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 really slimy what they're doing, and. Um, in terms of why should anyone outside of Seattle care about this, um, this is this is going to be a blueprint. Um, if if they're able to uh, go around the will of the constituents 
uh, with this bogus recall election um, to take out somebody who really uses their office um, to fight for working people. There, it's going to happen again in city after city and state after state. And as I pointed out, it's already happening. It's happening here in California. Um, so we, we have to stop them in their tracks. And I, that's why I think like every progressive in the country should have their eyes on this and try to help out in whatever way they can. That's insane. This this does seem to be a pattern. When you agree, Pascal, with uh, the recall of uh, your, the attempted recall of Gavin Newsom, uh, the write-in candidacy <laughs> against uh, oh my India God, Wall India, Wall, yeah, um, and also the uh, there's another one I'm forgetting. I just Nina Turner in Ohio. Nina Turner in Ohio getting neutralized. Yeah, they did hurt. The, the, the corporate. Uh, it's the, the, only thing the, it's only, the only thing the Democrats are good at doing is destroying progressive movements to their left. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, they did hurt really dirty. But uh, I mean, we too. saw we saw that the we, the Gavin Newsom recall was a far right. If anything, that's true. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I definitely mm-hmm. think it's a it's a combination of both that the left is up against and i don't know i don't know if we're really ready as you always say pascal the left doesn't have the 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 strength in the in this country to pop a grape it's nope. right when we do get <laughs> positions of power. Like, right like here here you you are and, and it, let's keep in mind it's a city council position we're not talking about mayor so want or governor so want or congress right so want. this is a city right. council position that right. millions of dollars get dumped into trying to kick this woman out of office and she just right. keeps winning but what makes me sad is the fact that it's hard for her to govern when not right. only is she you know kind of a, a person alone on the city council for being as far left as she is yeah. But you're constantly fighting both parties simultaneously. Right. And, I, and I really think we need to take, take a step back and, and look at and examine power once again, which is kind of a constant theme on the show. We talk about, you know, understanding how power works because, right. you know, she is fighting two extremely powerful parties and with ease, yeah. they're showing that the will of the people means nothing. Right. Because these are very right. undemocratic processes to get people uh, recalled. Extremely, extremely. And people, you know, the, the Democratic establishment absolutely does rule uh, Seattle, uh, to, to your other point about it being a mixture. However, um, this is definitely, there is a real right wing element to this. There is over 130 Trump donors. Um, including the number one Trump donor in the state um, and over 500 uh, Republican donors that have donated to the recall campaign, including this really gnarly dude, uh, billionaire Trump donor Martin Selig, who's like the landlord to the ICE building in Seattle. So, mm-hmm. I mean, th- they're there um, and, and they're in on this too. Um, uh, they, they, they definitely see her as a threat and, and they're, they're going to go to whatever lengths they can to try to get rid of her discourage others like us because we need we need a thousand uh shamas at like every level of government well when you go to the show can you pass a message that jason and pascal from this is revolution send uh janani rashandaran a shout out and uh, we hope she's doing well i would be happy to yeah definitely definitely because she was a, she was a guest on the show while she was uh while she was running uh, sadly, oh nice sadly she didn't win but she's still doing good work so she is doing good work yeah we really appreciate having her, um, having her there. Um, would it be okay, Jason, if I, I kind of put out some ask uh, to, to folks? Yeah, go for it. Okay, cool. So um, if you if you live in Seattle, uh, we're we're asking for a lot uh, because, as we just you know uh, described, we will need to do the kind of get out of the vote drive um, like never seen before to combat these really ruthless voter suppression tactics. So um, if you are in District Three. Um, we want you to make sure that you're registered to vote. Um, uh, the deadline is November 29th. Uh, you can do it online or in person, but don't wait that long. Um, we also are asking uh, Seattle District 3 voters to vote no on the recall before Thanksgiving. Um, the recall campaign is hoping 
that um, we're going to forget forget to vote in the flurry within the flurry of the holiday season, and so, you know it is a risk. So we want people to just get it done right away. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we're asking people to commit to talk to at least three people you know who live in District Three about voting no on the recall. And there's a pledge card on our website that I can also send you, ShawnaSolidarity.org. Um, we want to ask people to donate if they can, and we need boots on the ground. Uh, so we're asking people to sign up to do volunteer shit. I'm going to be going out to um, Seattle first week of December uh, to volunteer. Um, and so um, uh, if you live outside of Seattle, there's still a lot you can do to help. You can donate, you can phone bank, um, and you uh, can consider taking a trip to Seattle. Um, and also, if you personally know anyone in District 3 in Seattle, you can reach out to them and make sure they're registered to vote and plan to vote no um, on the recall. Uh, yeah. Was that it? I think that's it. <laughs> and I you're not doing any comedy? <laughs> uh, just like in the back corner with whoever's sitting at the table. <laughs> are, are, <laughs> Are yeah, any of the right. homies coming? Is like, is Nora? Is Nora going to be there? Is she? Is she? They they have been invited. I hope that she's listening and feels pressured uh, to go. Um, Anna might go. Um, Rafa was invited, but she's going to be out of town. Try to get her sister to come. Um, oh wow! Yeah, we'll we'll see. We'll see. I'm, I'm fingers crossed. These are all these are all show guests. They're not all, but a lot <laughs> of these people have been show guests. So this is going to be. I know. An exciting. I know. Who the fun back in the nineties? <laughs> <laughs> we were just talking about the, the goddamn nineties earlier on the show. <laughs> well, in, Enrique, right thank you. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to put the links up that you gave me. Um, okay. Thank you. I might send you a few more. Um, go for it. That's okay. Cool. Go for it. I'll cool. be on here for a little bit longer. So send me some more links and thank you for your time, Enrique. And uh, we'll, uh, thank you so much. Thanks for your solidarity. Appreciate it. Oh, for sure. For sure. We, we, we AHS Cougars stick together. <laughs> <Go> cougars. <laughs> All right. Thanks, you guys. Take care. All right. Peace. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. That was Enrique Vallejo with Socialist Alternative. They're doing a fundraiser for Kashama Sawan in Oakland, the town. I would have been there. Had I been in the town, so I am very sad. So when I saw Enrique invite me, I said, you know, I'll do what I can and put it on the show. There's a there's a handful of people from the Bay Area that watch the show. So Pascal, do you have any closing words? This is a good show. We definitely jumped into different subject matters. Enjoyed it very much. I uh, have to get ready for one of the shows that we have next week with a guest on a book that I need to finish reading, Haiti's Paper Wars. She's coming on the 18th. And we have Sam Cedar that's going to join us Tuesday. Yeah. Where we're going to talk about, uh, you know, his time at Air America and the need for left broadcasting. Left yeah, media. I'd really like to interrogate that with the Cedar and what he means by that. Yeah, and and what happened with Air America because he definitely has his opinion, his critique of Air America. So, I I definitely want to uh, get into the weeds with him about that, and uh, maybe he'll bring Janine Garofalo on as well. Mm, that'd be interesting. I'm just kidding. He probably will not. He'll probably just be there stoned. And also look for, if you are a patron, sooner than later, look for Pascal and I's Oxford University talk. I, it was Pascal's talk that I was featured in because I was having ridiculous Wi-Fi issues. So Pascal didn't just steal the show. He did a masterful job of uh doing what he does best and it was a beautiful thing to to see and to be a part of so i'm very 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 proud and happy and uh overjoyed at uh at our messaging and even the way it ended i thought the way it ended was very hopeful you see pascal is just angry now i'm not angry at all brother 
Oh, but Gene wrote sons just to remind, remind people that the gaming material show is coming up on Wednesday. Yes, gaming materialist is coming up on Wednesday. Regine uh, already recorded it with C. Derek Varn. It's Gene and Varn's show, and they're going to be talking to some union labor organizers that uh, work at one of the gaming companies that creates, I think, miniatures. So that'll be up Wednesday and Thursday. We'll have on what's the author's name, Pascal? Oh, Cynthia. I think Stein, I forgot the name of the, I have the book here somewhere. The, the book is Haiti's Paper War. It's about the political ideology of the founding republic and the uh, controversy over uh, what the uh, expectations were of the founding fathers of the Haitian uh, nation. And next Saturday, we'll be speaking with, I can't remember the author's name, but he wrote the book, The Meaning of Mark Fisher. So once again, we're going to get into the weeds on this idea of capitalist realism and how we can get beyond it so on that note if you are in oakland there is a comedy show please go see it there's links in the chat to get tickets and where it's at if you don't want to pre-get tickets you want to try to get them at the door and i think it's time for me to play cartoons thank you guys we are out.